Okay, well, we've made it uh, actually just a little after the top of the hour, but big thank you for being with us today and uh, welcome to uh, the book launch. Um, my name is Darren Short and I'm here to moderate the book launch for human resource development, critical perspectives and practices. Um, it's such an honor to be here for the hour. Um, I'll be uh, keeping us on track time-wise and also be supporting you all through managing the Q&A and the chat. If you have any issues at all during this next hour, uh, please just reach out to me through the chat and I'll help you. It's wonderful to have so many people actually here with us today and attending from so many different countries. Um, I'm sure that in part this is due to the significance and the timing of the book and its contents and, and also due to the depth of experience and, and breadth of perspectives that we have within the authorship team. It's great today that I'm joined by all five authors and also by Unbi Sim of the University of Georgia, who played a key role in the book's development. So over the next hour, you'll hear from each of the authors about the framework for the book and some of the key quotes and features of each of the book sections. We'll then allow time at the end for, for questions and for, and for reactions. Talking of questions, uh, in addition to having time at the end, uh, you can also ask questions using the Q&A function throughout the hour, and you'll see that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, those questions are visible to all of the presenters, and so we'll be answering those as we go through the presentation. You can also ask questions or make comments in the chat function as well. And, and when we get to the end, if you want to request permission to share your audio, then we can do that as well. And then finally, before handing over to Laura Beamer, I'd like to remind you all that we're recording the hour, which includes recording everything that's said and everything that's shared via Q&A and via chat. So please remember that as you participate. Okay, so that's all of my housekeeping complete. So let me hand you over in that case to Dr. Laura Beamer. Laura, over to you. Oh, Darren, thank you so much for moderating our session today and leading us off so, so wonderfully. I'm Laura Birma, and I'm a professor at the University of Georgia. And thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, happy Halloween to those who celebrate. And uh, we really appreciate your time and presence and, of course, the wonderful you, work you do in our field. And uh, Dr. Callahan, Jamie and I are going to kick things off, and I'm going to start and give you a little bit of background about how the book came to be. But before I do that, Jamie, would you like to say hello? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jamie Callahan, Professor of Organization and Ethics at the Durham University Business School in the UK. And we're really excited to see you here. Happy Halloween and uh, um, welcome to our book launch. All right, thanks so much. So first, how did this book come into being? And I think that Jamie and I have been colleagues and collaborators for a long time. And we were both disenchanted with the dominant instrumental masculine performative models and discourse that really dominated our field of human resource development. And when I mentioned all of that string of words, things we're referring to in particular would be the infamous three-legged stool that stands on legs of economics, systems, and psychological theories on top of a rug of ethics that was added at a later point, or the binary polarizing learning versus performance debate that was never intended to describe reality. We talk about that more in chapter two. And references to humans with, and I'm paraphrasing here, but calling them brokers of productivity, ready to unleash their productive selves in the name of profit and performance, uh, and so on. And you know those ideals and standpoints were not what Jamie and I were teaching our students, nor was it how we practiced HRD or how we wanted to represent the field. And so we decided to write a book. And Jamie will tell you a little bit more about how that started. And so the book 
authorship team represents the blending of two separate teams. We were both approached by Rutledge to write this book. One team was from the UK, one team was from the US. And we got together talking and realized that rather than writing two books that competed and each took a national focus on the US or the UK, we realized that we wanted to expand beyond our silos, that we collaborated so much with one another and so much of what we did informed each other that we decided to join forces and co-author the book. And our authorship team has changed over time and, and moved and, and shifted. And it still represents both of those viewpoints, but it also brings in different generational focuses um, uh, and different standpoints in, in how we're looking at the field. So we needed more voices. Um, right now, we include quite a bit from the US and UK with some tiptoes beyond, as you'll see in this launch, and expect the next edition to expand even further. If our team has the energy. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much, Jamie. And so the figure you see in front of you is the framework we proposed for critical HRD in 2014. And this was an, ad an advances in developing human resources article that Jamie and I co-authored. And what we wanted to take on was not only some of the dominant discourse I just described, but also we wanted to dismantle what we started calling the holy trinity of HRD, which is training and development, career development, and organization development. Not that those aren't important things, but we were trying to think about HRD as a way of being and what are the actions and behaviors that people do in organizations. And we came up with a model of relating, learning, changing, and organizing that are overlapping ways that we create um, complex and often contested space of the workplace. And within that, we also attend to four different concepts. We look at social context in each of those circles in, ter in terms of the place that HRD takes place, the stakeholders, and that's a plural word, not just management, the people, the process, actually, you know, what is HRD? What do we do when we say that? And the method of how we do it. So, so we also felt, <laughs> thanks, Laura. We also felt that the prevailing um, theories and discourses really simplified what HRD was far too much. It ignored the messiness, the paradox, the challenge of serving human beings when at times the organization works directly against their interests. And so keeping people motivated while downsizing, um, mixing mess mixed messages that people were getting during the COVID-19 pandemic um, all across all over the world, continuing to re receive um, information about remote work versus returning to the office as if COVID-19 never happened. So those were the kinds of things that we really began to think we need to be more complex about the way that we're addressing these things. And so over to Laura to talk about our aims. And so we wanted to create a way of viewing HRD that was active and acknowledged the gray areas, challenges, and controversies that organization systems create, while also challenging dominant theory, discourse, research, and practice that we view as masculine, racist, heteronormative, patriarchal, colonizing, management centric and so on. And this was not an easy task. I think it's hard enough to write a book, uh, even harder when you are trying to rethink something. And this is why we had a really diverse uh, international team. In addition to the framework, the four circles you see there for the book, we added two other sections. So there's an introductory section, and then there's a final section on holistic HRD, which ties our thinking about HRD theory and practice together. We also want to acknowledge, and we think it's important to acknowledge this, the value of a contribution to our model by Collins, McFadden, Rocco, and Mathis in their 2015 article in Human Resource Development Review. They built on our model of critical HRD by proposing a fifth way of being, and I quote, advocating as relating, learning, changing, and organizing on behalf of others. Although Jamie and I don't know if Collins at all would agree with us fully, we see advocacy as implied in our model in our four concentric circles. And importantly, Collins et al. made a needed contribution urging the HRD field to be more responsive to the issues transgender workers face and engage in advocacy more intentionally. 
Advocacy is the why of the critical work in this model and in this book. And advocacy for more humane, just, and humanly sustainable organizations through critical HRD. Jamie. So for those of you who haven't read our blurb at this point, I wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of our intention and ultimately the book from the introductory lines. Um, the book covers the basic tenets of HRD, interrogates the dominant paradigms and practices of the field, teaches readers how to critically assess HRD practices and outcomes, and provide some critical alternatives. The text also addresses HRD as a contested field and the importance for HRD professionals to reflect on their values, maintain their sanity, and also retain their employment while attempting to do this very difficult work that serves multiple stakeholders. And even though we've written it from a critical perspective, this book really is intended for everyone, for practitioners, students, scholars of HRD. We really tried to make it thought provoking, interesting, accessible, and fun. And we hope you'll be the judge of that. Over to As you. Of, thank you. As a way of framing our remarks, each of us is profiling one of the six sections of the book and I will start with the introduction. And we'll tell you a little bit about the topics in each section. Uh, we have framing quotes for each chapter and we will profile one or two of the features of the book that we're really excited about. And Darren, you can go into the next slide. The, the features of the book are here on this slide. So each chapter starts with a box of an overview and then you'll see boxes on this screen scattered throughout the chapters that give you points for reflection, points to ponder, case studies in HRD and tips and tools to help you be a more effective HRD practitioner. And with that, I will roll right into the introduction of the book. All right. So the introduction starts actually with the quote, history is never for itself. It is always for someone. And this is actually chapter one, I should say, excuse me. And this is chapter one, history of HRD and theory. And so this quote begins. And one of the things we encourage you to think about when reading this chapter and when you think about HRD theory and practice is whose history is this? Who's the practice for? And this chapter examines stories about the origins and assumptions of HRD. And I'm willing to bet um, you will be unfamiliar with some of the history that we've been able to uh, put together for this chapter as the history of HRD has excluded important narratives, um, perspectives, and thinkers. And there are a range of ideas and sources that I think will be really helpful to HRD research and practice as we know it. So that's chapter one. There's only one other chapter in this uh, particular section of the book to frame it up. And that is chapter two, Meta Narratives of HRD Paradigms, Practices, and Processes. And it begins with the quote uh, that you see next, a paradigm is a way of interpreting the world, also known as a mental model, narrative, or picture of what an individual group or society determines to be reality. And this is Thomas Kuhn, who probably is one of the most cited scientists in history, who wrote a lot about scientific thinking and paradigms. This chapter basically unpacks the meta narratives or discourses of HRD. To us, words matter, they contradict, and they inform our thoughts and actions. So for, inst for instance, um, this, this chapter talks about the contested nature of HRD advocating for workers while you may be also working to implement policy that harms them, for instance. And uh, it delves into the meaning and history behind certain things you've heard before, like learning versus performance is probably the most enduring uh, paradox of our field. And it's not true, but I think people take that discourse as if they are two processes pitted against one another. This chapter also gives you some tools for working with meta narratives. And the feature of this section is in chapter two, and it is a box on points to ponder. And it is an example of misogynistic discourse. And it is a link to the 2012 video by Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard's misogyny speech. And it was known as Australia's most famous and unforgettable TV moment. And I encourage you to watch it. It is absolutely brilliant. So together, these two chapters and in the introductory section set the frame for the book 
that seeks to disrupt traditional ways of thinking about HRD practice, research, and teaching, while taking an unvarnished look at the complexities of working in organizations and other spaces where there are humans. And we hope that human sustainability can be brought to the forefront through the work of HRD and this book, since working in an organization should be a, a right to be treated with dignity and care. Thank you for being here and for your interest in our work. And now I have the privilege of passing the baton to Unbi Sim, who has been my graduate research assistant at UGA. She is marvelous and she played an absolutely instrumental role in editing and helping us format the book. So Unbi, to you. Um, thank you, Dr. Birma. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Envy, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm the in the third year of the Learning Leadership and Organization Development Program at the University of Georgia. And yes, Dr. Laura Birma is my advisor, and I have been studying critical HRD. So I joined this amazing team as a graduate uh, research assistant. And um, as an international PhD student, it's a huge honor and privilege to have this um, amazing opportunity to join this webinar as a panelist. I'm very happy to introduce uh, this, the relating section. Thank you. Yeah, the relating section, which is my favorite because um, the relating aspects of the critical HRD model especially show critical HRD's commitment to people by addressing the issues around how people should treat each other and connect all levels of the organizations. So this relating section answers the principal question, whom do we serve through the three chapters, um, stakeholders and power, EDRD, which is the acronym of equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization, and work relationships. And I want to begin with the first quote showing the importance of relationships. Um, let me just read it. Um, human relationships always help us carry on because they always presuppose for the developments of future. And also because we live as if our only task was to have relationship with other people. So the chapter five work relationship chapter in the relating section focuses on exploring the role of HRD in human relationships, not only at individual and interpersonal levels, but also at the organization level, such as recruiting, recruiting, onboarding, and developing. And additionally, this chapter provides useful tips and tools about how to maintain and facilitate healthy and sustainable work relationships. And um, going back to chapter three, titled Stakeholders and Power, this chapter recognizes the power in relating, which is also seen in the second quote, power is embedded in the relational shaping of the work. So the chapter three focuses on understanding the relationships of uh, power amongst the stakeholders and allows the readers to think about the provocative question in whose interest does this serve? So this chapter really helped me as uh, so one of the researchers to understand the differences between stakeholders and stakeholders and the types and objects of power, uh, strategies for addressing inc incivility and critical approaches to leadership and knowledge management. And lastly, chapter four, my favorite chapter, specifically talks about EDID, again, equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization, which acknowledges and highlights the importance of decolonization in developing work relationships to promote organizational social justice. So the mapping your identity activity really resonated with me as I uh, define myself as an intersectional feminist. So um, to me, this activity was simple, but uh, powerful. So it begins with, it begins with listing participants, um, such as your social identities, such as gender, race, ethnicity, age, nationality, sexual orientation, uh, religion and class and other social identities, and uh, let them reflect on how their social identities 
are intertwined and overlap and impact the way they relate to their work. So the sample question include um, which identities do you think about most often, least often? Which identities most influence how see yourself, how you see yourself? Which identities most influence how others see you? And what identities are marginalized or privileged? How do these identities combined inform the way that you relate to your work? How do these identities combined inform how you will practice as an HRD professional? So and in addition to the intersectionality tool, the relating section, the whole section provides many tips and cases related to work relationships, power, and EDID. And I believe you all like and really love them. And yeah, thank you so much for listening. And I would like to hand it over to Dr. Collins. Uh, thank you for that, Unbi, and, and thank you for your continued support of this project. You were really instrumental in helping us get this book across the finish line and so clearly a rising star in our field. And I'm I'm very happy that you are here with us today. Um, my name is Josh Collins. I'm an associate professor of HRD um, and the director of undergraduate studies in organizational um, leadership, policy, and development at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. I'm also a current board member of the Academy of HRD. Um, and before I get started, I just want to say I'm I'm so honored to be here. I still can't believe that I got to write a book with some of the very same scholars who have been so foundational to my own understanding of and position within the field. And I'm just truly humbled to be a part of this group and a part of this project. Um, today, I'm going to uh, introduce the learning section of our book. My educational background is in both adult education and HRD. Um, I've always considered myself to be a scholar of both disciplines. In fact, I, I don't necessarily see two separate disciplines when I observe my priorities in each. Um, my first faculty position was in an adult learning program. And like many HRD scholars, much of my, my research centers on the importance of adult learning concepts, theories, and experiences in organizations. So, the learning section um, really seeks to disrupt, uh, as Laura was mentioning, kind of the performative foundations of what it means to learn and to be a learner within the context of HRD and in organizations and workplaces. And um, we worked really, really diligently to decenter some of the more um, mechanistic understandings of learning and instead build the perspective in this book around the idea that a worker's priorities may differ from what the organization wants them to learn. So for example, if you think about a uh, tech startup, um, the organization might prioritize something like learning new programming languages. Obviously that might be important, but an employee might experiencing the organizational culture find value in developing soft skills like effective communication or conflict resolution, things that tend to characterize uh, the real challenges faced in these kinds of startups. And this divergence creates a nuanced environment where learning objectives can be at odds. And I think that our book really recognizing, our book really works hard to recognize that it's crucial for both parties to thrive, um, to recognize this reality. So the learning section emphasizes the ways that learning in HRD is affected by context, stakeholders, process, and method. And this line of questioning leads us to promote um, practices such as critical reflection um, and active learning. So chapter six entitled Learning uh, Theory and Practice begins with a well-known quote um, from Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Knowledge emerges only through invention and reinvention through the restless, impatient, continuing, hopeful inquiry human beings pursue in the world, with the world, and with each other. And this chapter serves to provide an overview of learning theory and practice as they relate to the field of HRD. Um, and we offer the following definition of learning. Learning is a process of transforming the basis of one's knowledge, skill, and attitude to create the potential for behavioral change. 
through this, we explore foundational understandings such um, andragogy, uh, self-direction, um, different philosophies of learning from behaviorism to constructivism, formal, non-formal, incidental learning, among other things. And we conclude the chapter with the questions, in whose interests do HRD interventions primarily serve? profit or people, and whose interests or how can those interests be, be balanced? Um, and we propose that developing answers to these questions um, by nature must begin with and involve encouraging HRD scholars and practitioners to interrogate the types of learning that are most engaging to them. So my favorite uh, points to ponder in chapter six, ask the reader to reflect on their own learning experiences and to consider whether they tend to benefit more from interacting with new material um, or receiving that new material via lecture, right? So we encourage the reader to identify a vivid memory of learning and to ask themselves how that learning occurred through experience or by being told about it. Moving on now to chapter seven entitled Adult Learning Discourses and Practices in HRD, um, we open with a quote from the late U.S. representative and really a pillar of American civil rights movement, um, John Lewis. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. And this quote really serves to, I think, remind us of the importance of activism um, in any setting, to enact and to inspire social change, something that I've personally observed being at the forefront of many of my students' minds, the minds of many practitioners as they look at the world that often feels like it's becoming more hostile and violent, more resistant to change, more inequitable. Um, this chapter discusses the power of dominant discourse in society um, and in the field of HRD. We talk about historical shifts influencing how adult learning has been understood in HRD, um, definitions for adult learning and development, dilemmas and discourses surrounding training and training effectiveness as that relates to learning, um, and creating cultures of learning and organizations. And my favorite part of chapter seven is the section where we continue to unpack the false dichotomy of learning versus performance. Um, as Laura was discussing earlier, this is a conversation that has dominated HRD conferences, journals, classrooms, practices for decades now. Um, and in alignment with the late Phyllis Cunningham's early critiques of what she observed in HRD conference keynotes, we state emphatically that learning should not be subordinate to performance. Performance cannot be effective without learning, and that learning is a prerequisite to many activities, including performance. So the exercise that I wish to highlight from chapter seven invites practitioners to compare managerial and employee perceptions of employee responsibilities. Um, and this really differs from traditional top-down assessments by advocating for an open dialogue and mutual goal setting. The exercise describes a process wherein workers and supervisors or managers separately report uh, the top five things that the employee is responsible for doing in their job. And then any discrepancies in those lists are used as a springboard for a conversation around expectations and priorities. So obviously this is just a quick summary I'm able to provide in our short time together today. We really believe that our discussion of learning, adult learning, adult education, and learning for change has the capacity to help reimagine the priorities around learning and performance in the field of HRD. And we're really excited by the possibilities that we hope are opened up through these perspectives. And I'll pass it now to Dr. Tamika Greer. Ah, thank you, Josh. Um, hello, everyone. I am Dr. Tamika Greer. I am an assistant professor of HRD at the University of Houston, also the program coordinator uh, for our undergraduate program and a current uh, Academy of Human Resource Development board member as well. Um, and I just wanna echo first and foremost uh, what Josh just said about uh, the absolute privilege it has been to work with this particular team, um, especially because this team is made up of people who have been instrumental in my career, um, starting with Jamie Callahan, who actually 
created a pathway basically for me to earn my doctorate at Texas A&M University many years ago. And then uh, Laura Birma, who was my career inspiration from the moment I met her, what, 15 years ago. Um, so it is absolutely a privilege to work with this team. Um, so my portion of the book that I'm going to talk about today is changing. And changing is all about modifying or altering um, things as they exist. And we can see change happen for individuals. We can see change happen in organizations across countries, very different contexts where we see change. Um, but I think what's important here is that when we alter and when we modify, change actually creates an opportunity for us to correct things maybe that aren't optimal. And we, when we think about this from a critical HRD perspective, we're talking about um, creating more equity, we're talking about creating structures and processes um, and access for individuals throughout an organization. And so change is often planned but often unplanned, right? And so there are opportunities for us to present models and um, processes and step-by-step -step, um, to show how change happens. But there's also a realization that often change does not go exactly as we planned. And it is the goal and the role of HRD to facilitate all types of change, right? Whether they be planned initiatives or unplanned initiatives that we respond to in the moment. Okay. And so with that thinking, we emphasize um, in our chapters on change, the, the role of leaders and their importance in being able to emphasize uh, equity and access during the changes. Okay. So in the two chapters devoted to change, you'll see some of the, what I would call traditional uh, change models presented, but certainly in a new light, thinking of them as tools for creating equity um, and uh, addressing social justice issues in our organizations. Um, and so it, it becomes then, like I said, a tool for, for that type of change. And so we start chapter eight, which is entitled Theory and Practice of Change, with a quote from Margaret Mead that reads, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And that just reminds us that it's not just the leaders, but it is every person in the organization that can have a role and be involved in change, particularly change that is um, equitable and accessible and sustainable uh, for the human condition. And in the second chapter on change, which is chapter nine, um, our, we open that quote with, a bad system will beat a good person every time. And that emphasizes the role that actual structures, organizational structure, blah, organizational structures, societal structures, um, social structures can actually uh, diminish the effect that um, that one person can have on change, right? So it is this tension that happens when we affect change between the individual effort and the societal or whatever the contextual structure happens to be, right? And it is the tools that we teach in chapter eight and chapter nine that help us to overcome those um, or change those structures, those systemic structures. And so in chapter eight, in chapter nine, two of my favorite um, kind of connecting principle is this idea of failure. So failures in chapter eight, pitfalls in chapter nine, they both point to the same idea that sometimes we have to realize that the way things are or the way things end up may not be as they should be, right? And we offer guidance on what to do then if the situation doesn't fit what it should be. Think of this in terms of if we have um, unfairly disadvantaged certain people in an organization or it's historically been that way. How then can we see that as maybe a maybe a potential failure and pick ourselves up and, and, and go with courage to then change the system processes, structures, those sorts of things, right? So I really like that we're willing to admit that maybe things aren't always as they should be, but these are ways that we can use the changing in HRD to make things right. Okay. And so I now have the privilege of introducing 
Dr. Carol Elliott. Thank you, Tamika. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, my name's uh, Carol Elliott. I'm Professor of Organization Studies at Sheffield University Management School. Um, and I'm also uh, co-chair, have the honor of co-chairing the Research Development Committee of the University Forum for HRD. And I'm a former Editor-in-Chief of Human Resource Development International. I've been in the field for quite a while. Um, and I'm very, very happy to introduce the organizing in HRD section of this book, which comprises chapters 10 and chapters 11. And organizing is a fourth aspect of the BMA Callahan critical HRD model, uh, which, which uh, Laura introduced at the very top of this presentation. So in this, in this section, we explore how the space of organizing has been conceptualized and operationalized as a means of enacting people in the work of the enterprise. Enterprise very broadly defined as, uh, as the example that I will draw on later illustrates uh, quite clearly. And I should say also that um, unlike uh, previous speakers, I've always worked in management schools, when I, in my academic career at least, uh, always worked in management schools in the UK. And in my work in critical HRD, certainly in the year, early years, I was very strongly informed, influenced by critical management studies, which was uh, an area of uh, research, uh, a movement, if you will, within academic uh, research in management and business schools that emerged in, in, the, in the 1990s. And um, very much influenced by critical theory and critical theory's intent to draw intention to power relationships. And I think you've probably got a, a sense of that as, as my colleagues have already spoken already uh, about that intent to constantly uh, critique, examine and understand how power operates in different organizational contexts, different organizational settings and how that influences, impacts us as HRD professionals, HRD academics, people who are interested in, in uh, human resource development very broadly. So the organizing section addresses a question of great importance to us all. How do critical HRD professionals realize the power of organizing structures and the creation of cultures that support human sustainability and well-being? Uh, this is a really a core principle, I would suggest, at, at the heart of this book, the, the interest, the need to support sustainability and well-being. So at the, at the top of the slide here, we have this um, uh, quote by uh, from Miles Horton's uh, autobiography, The Long Haul, which tells the story of the, the, the autobiography, The Long Haul, tells the story of the, the Highlander Folk School, an organization that has been a major catalyst for social change in the US since the 1930s. And this quote, I think, nicely alludes to the challenges of organizing. Unlike man, many contemporary forms of organizing that equate organizing to a process of command and control, Horton's suggestion in this quote is to allow yourself space to breathe when organizing for change. Recognizing organizing for change is difficult, but to allow yourself space for reflection and to, to, to pause and to not assume that everything will be all right, everything will be uh, under control. Um, so organizing um, in, in the two chapters in this section are really, we perceive them as something that happens through, through context, through stakeholders, and through process. And uh, Tamika earlier was talking about uh, structures and understanding structures and how structures are so, can be liberating, but they can also be constraining and they can also shut things down. So I think these, the chapter on organizing in particular takes a a very, um, I think, <laughs> I'm biased clearly, but I think this is a, this is unusual. This chapter is really unusual in the in the breadth of HRD literature in the HRD textbooks that have come before us because of this our real focus on organisation theory, organisation practice. We do this to a, to a depth that I don't think um, I have witnessed in previous books, and I think that speaks to the influence that. Um, uh, different authors bring to the book and our different disciplinary backgrounds. Um, so I've already said, I think, that the organizing section consists of two chapters, chapter 10, Constructing Organizations, 
and chapter 11, accountability in human resource development. So on this slide also, you see um, a quote from, from Jamie's uh, previous work, where she says, an organization can be defined as a relatively voluntary collective of actors committed to interacting toward a mutually constructed and interpreted in endeavor or set of endeavors. So this quote, I, th I think this is a great quote because it hints at the complexity we face in creating and developing organizations or spaces of organizing. The underlying value assumption here is that members of an organization have a collective voice in identifying what they will do. The emphasis is not on the ends or goals, but on the processes of interaction. But I also think the quote also subtly alludes to the necessity of recognizing and negotiating power relationships. Critical HRD professionals recognize that despite role restrictions, role, role restrictions, role descriptions, that was a Freudian slip, and organizational structures, organizations are nevertheless fragile. The individuals and groups who make up an organization will interpret differently what their roles are. Organizations aren't static, they're constantly evolving, and that requires our critical developmental attention. We hope we can communicate this understanding in the book and the book in general, in, in this section rather, and the book in general. So I'm just going to finish my overview of the organizing section by briefly mentioning why we have included the case in point, the case study of the Akashinga All Women Ranger Programme, which can be found in the accountability chapter. Um, quite fortuitously, I discovered, I found out about this programme whilst listening to a podcast prior to my departure to an AHRD conference a few years ago. Uh, I think it was supposed to be in 2018 or 2019, certainly before COVID. Uh, and I listened to this podcast and I listened to the founder of this program, uh, the Akashinga All Women Program, All Women Ranger Program uh, in, in Zimbabwe. And I like it as a case because it illustrates how organizing differently can be inclusive and benefit individual societies and the environment. So the Akashinga program is an all women anti-poaching unit who aim, whose aim is to build, to build an alternative to the Western conceived militarized approach to the wildlife conservation, which defends colonial boundaries between nature and humans. Akashinga is a community driven conservation model empowering disadvantaged women to restore and manage a network of wilderness areas as an alternative to trophy hunting. The women who form Akashinga are all trained to deal with a variety of situations they may face. However, in contrast to more common methods applied to anti-poaching, their approach is to work with rather than against local populations to make the long-term benefits for local communities and wildlife sustainable. The example of the Akashinga program to anti-poaching is an illustration how recognizing accountability for action has real consequences for the lives of other individuals, local communities, and social and ecological environments. It is also a neat illustration, I think, of how taking responsibility for the protection of others, in this case, wildlife and local communities, is not motivated by external mechanisms of regulation. Rather, it is an example of an organization whose practice is rooted in an awareness of a variety of stakeholder concerns, but whose principal responsibility is to ecological sustainability. So I think it's very much time for me now to hand over to, to Dr. Jamie Callahan who will talk about the next section of the book. Over to you, Jamie. Thanks, Carol. I'm back again and delighted to tell you a bit about the final section of the book, Practicing HRD Holistically. And I recognize that I wanna go through this fairly quickly, although I have three chapters to discuss. So I'll kind of go over them more quickly than I might otherwise. This section pulls all four pieces of our framework together. The idea of, of holistic is that the parts of something are interconnected and interdependent and must be understood as a whole. And practicing critical HRD really demands that we apply a holistic mindset and view the role of HRD practitioners as advocacy for all stakeholders. So chapter 12, um, is about critical interventions. And Laura Birma opens that, a quote by Laura Birma opens that, that section or that chapter by arguing that good consultants work themselves out of a job. And the chapter addresses the distinctions between traditional interventions and critical interventions and proposes different ways to develop intervention to develop individuals and organizations that take account of a wider range of stakeholders. 
And while chapter nine talked about how to plan some HRD interventions, chapter 12 builds on those ideas and offers in the moment interventions that have a critical orientation. And this is where one of my favorite call out box pairs, if you will, comes in. Um, I chose just one out of the entire three chapters to highlight for you. And box 12 and box 12, 12.2, 12.1 and 12.2 are about tempered radicalism. Box 12.1 is a case study of an HRD professional who was given a straightforward task and how she leveraged that task to subvert the dominant practices in the organization. And I'll let you read the, the case study um, to find out more about what the case is. But chapter two, box 12.2, talks about the tempered radicalism that she engaged in to do that leveraging and subverting. She, she show, It shows how you follow a series of, of tips and tools for different kinds of ways of engaging in the, in the concept of tempered radicalism, which is a slow and subtle way of radically changing what happens in organizations. Chapter 13 is evaluation, which happens to be one of my favorite HRD topics to teach. Anyone who's taken a class with me in HRD knows that my famous chocolate chip cookie logic model evaluation, which I adapted from Darlene Russeft and Hallie, Hallie Presco. Um, so the idea of evaluation is that it's a huge field within HRD. And much of the work that we are exposed to within the idea of evaluation is very traditional in nature. And this is kind of highlighted by the table 12, 13.1 that I've included here on this slide. It shows that traditional rationale of why we engage in evaluation. But then we share the idea of critical rationale and how it, it changes the way we think about the purpose of what evaluation is and how we can apply it. So we ask these questions again, in whose interest does this really serve? So the chapter defines what evaluation is. It helps HRD professionals interrogate who the stakeholders of an evaluation are, how to assess their interest, understanding how to engage in evaluation, and really gives a different perspective of what evaluation could be. The chapter asks of HRD professionals to follow Linda Tuhiwai Smith's call to evaluators, which is the challenge is always to demystify, to decolonize. And our intent with that chapter is to give readers an introduction to not only some of the traditional forms of evaluation, but also some critical forms and perspectives of evaluation. And finally, much of our book brings us to the future of the field of HRD. The final chapter of the book, chapter 14, and kind of highlighting a question that Barbara wrote earlier about what is our future research? Well, this shares some of those future ideas. Um, the opening quote from the chapter four is from the novel, The Overstory by Richard Powers. It says, you can't see what you don't understand, but what you think you understand, you'll fail to notice. And to me, this question really serves not only to, to bring up the idea of, of what our future could be, but it also asks us to kind of change the way that we think about not only equity, diversity, and inclusion, and decolonization, but this also serves us as a reminder that our practice requires a search for understandings and new understandings, and we need to always interrogate our practice to notice anew that which we think we already understand. And the fight for conser conservation is what begins that chapter 14, saying the vast possibilities of our future will become realities only if we make ourselves, in a sense, responsible for that future. So we look at things like COVID-19, remote work, health and well-being, digitization. These are all some of the amongst the most important issues that we address that we think are relevant for our future. And they're based on things that are happening now and beginning to change the way we see things. So we use critical perspectives to interrogate those issues. And as we ask and interrogate our practice, ask and interrogate what our understandings and new understandings are, we're also asking you to say, hmm, this might've helped them do that. How does it help us do that? Because this is where we think our future goes. And we think that this particular topic is going to change the way we think about the field of HRD. And so over to Darren for questions and comments. Thank you so much, Jamie. We've had a 
We've got a, quite a few good questions coming in. So I, I'm, I'm going to try and do our, my best to get us through those in the limited time that we've got available. And I would love to start actually by throwing out to the panel a question that's come in from Jim Stewart. So thank you so much, Jim, for being with us today. And, and Jim's question is about how the authors see their book sitting in with previous and current work on critical HRD. So I'm not sure who would like to... Answer. I'll start. I, I be quick. I think one answer to that is in the name of the book, right, which was very intentional. It is not titled Critical Human Resource Development. It is entitled Human Resource Development, Critical Perspectives and Practices. And I think there was a lot of intent behind that to, um, to imagine an HRD that is not centered on the three-legged stool or the octopus or many of the other ways that it's been described, but being reimagined in a contemporary context responsive to contemporary realities of social justice, diversity, and other things that have historically been not just marginalized, but ignored and at times silenced in our field. Um, so it's really a reimagining, a transformation of the field, in my mind, in conversation with that foundational scholarship, but taking us to kind of that next level, that next vantage point that responds to current realities. Perfect. Anybody else want to jump in to add to, to Josh's response? If not, we'll move on to question two. Okay, then. So our, question, our second question then for anybody in the panel who'd like to take it. How did you find that writing this book changed the way that you view HRD? I, I can start. <laughs> I think for me, one of the things it did is really to highlight and emphasize for me what were the the um, the perspectives that I wanted to actually um, reduce <laughs> in my own in the own way I research and practice in HRD and it really brought to light how so many of the teaching tools and the the teachers um, that we have and that have loud voices really um, have emphasized a perspective that I think needs to be challenged. And so it was an exercise for me with every paragraph that I wrote of thinking, is this really what I want to say? Is this looking at this critically? Am I regurgitating something that someone told me? Or is this, um, you know, the, the interrogation that I want to do with this topic? Yeah, I'll just add something as well, if, if I may. I just, um, I just really, you know, I'm constantly learning. I was throughout, I think that hints at Tamika's uh, answer as well, that I, every, you know, every paragraph I wrote or every section I started, I thought, oh, there's there's still so much out there that I don't know. So it was a process, you know, it's still a process of learning for me, writing, I mean, writing always is, I think, but uh, particularly this book, which is, you know, you know, has a large, a large scope and, um, you know, so, you know, learning from everybody or my co-authors and, you know, finding things that I didn't know existed and uh yeah and um I, I think that's that's the thing I think I, I was just I'm still I'm still learning and there's still more to learn and there's still ways in which we can develop the field. Yes, and I'll just add briefly, and of course this is a shameless plug that we are doing a focus session at the upcoming AHRD conference. And um, there we're, we're going to talk more about the book and also about the writing process as a writing team. So we invite you to that. But I will also say, I mean, it was a huge learning process. And I hope you will leave this, even if you don't consider yourself a critical scholar or practitioner or researcher, is taking it, thinking about things critically and asking hard questions is something we should all be doing. And, and I think that this book, really pushed me even further to make sure that I am asking questions and I am stopping to think before just doing what we think needs to happen next. So it's for everyone. 
I'm talking of shameless plugs, and I'm all for them, Laura. Um, uh, uh, Gregory just asked in the chat about a discount code, and we just so happen to have a slide here that you can talk to. <laughs> we'll put it in the chat, too, to make it very easy for you to buy the book, uh, which does help us get our book up to number one on Amazon, which I think was mentioned by Jay, or number two currently, which today is the launch date. So... That's that's nice. Um, what I will do, um, and I'm conscious probably many people here have got a hard stop at the top of the hour. What I will do is drop an email around to everybody who registered for this session. Uh, so I include the code in that email and also a link to the recording of this launch as well so that you can get full, um, you can go back through and reference it or share it with others because I think it would be super helpful. Um, so I think a, a good question to wrap up with, conscious that we have just maybe like three minutes left. Um, uh, Barbara Banks, Barbara, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, put a question in the chat, which, which feels like a good, um, a good closing question because Barbara's said that often when writing, we find that not everything we want can be included. And so what's not included that you think is related but not addressed within the book? In other words, what do you see as the future research implications? I'll take a first stab at this since <laughs> I've been a little bit silent. Um, I, and I skimmed over the future research implications piece. I think so many of those are going to be important. Um, as you know, as we wrapped up this book, AI hit um, the, the field. And, and so that's one piece that I feel like the implications of that for what we do in HRD um, is something that we're going to want to address um, going down. And how do, we, how do we look at that as relating? Do we look at it around organizing? How do we interweave that into our ways of understanding how we learn, relate, organize, um, and change? Um, another piece of it is COVID-19, while I'll, I'm, I'm tired of the whole COVID-19 piece, it's still affecting the way we organize, the way that we think about how we engage in our work. And we touch on that as something that we need to be paying attention to in the future. Um, so those are two pieces that, that I'll leave you with because I know that my colleagues have many more. Yeah, it was, it was something um, that was mentioned, at, I can't remember, it was Laura or Jamie mentioned it now, I apologize for that. Um, but it was about how uh, we're a UK, predominantly UK, US, Global North writing team. And I'm very conscious that there are many things happening in, in different parts of the world that just that we need to learn more about, but also that that we couldn't include because of, you know, the necessarily page limits, word limits that we have on and any piece of writing activity. So I think for me, you know, in a second edition, future editions, that will be something that we will have time to concentrate how I'm having established this, this very solid foundation. Excellent. Well, I am conscious that we are reaching the top of the hour and um, I feel like we should wrap it up, although we still have questions. So what we're going to do, I think uh, Laura did a wonderful um, plug for the focus session at the Academy conference happening in February. Um, and so I think we can um, invite the panel to take the remaining questions and to feed those into, uh, into that session. Um, but a big thank you to everybody for coming to the launch. Um, it's wonderful to have such a, a great attendance today. Um, and also thank you to everybody on the panel for being a part of what I think is an absolutely fantastic book. I think it's the best book I read on HRD probably ever that I can remember. I read it cover to cover before saying yes to moderating the session. And oh, I, it was just a fantastic read. If you haven't yet got it, I definitely encourage you to get a hold of it. It'll change the way you think about HRD. So thank you all so much indeed for the hour. I will drop an email around with all the details and the links, uh, the link to the recording. But thank you all and hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you, Darren and all. Ditto that. Thanks. Happy Halloween. Yeah, yes. happy Halloween. <laughs>